How much sin do we have? Huh? Before you have to get spring back to action. Huh? Half hour. Half hour. Okay, so I'll try to be on the engaging side. Okay. So, I hope that at least that brief thing made it more or less clear, and of course we could have got into more details, but the message is very simple. That yes, the stability, the posture and stability is fundamentally dependent on the properties of the connective tissue. And again, enveloping and the spatial. And therefore, of course, the abdominal cavity is the simplest example of that particular spacing and stability. But obviously, by the same vein, it goes towards the thoracic cavity at the very least, right? So therefore, when you see this type of appearance, and this is not something exceptional, right? So obviously, well, I guess from what I understood, you mainly work with the individuals above the age of 12 and so on, right? Am I? No? Oh, with, so, but just you're mainly working with kids or with young adults, or like teenagers? Adults only. We do once in a while have teenagers. But, but mostly it's adults. Mostly, yeah. Mostly it's adults. Okay, so, but, well, she's like 12, at least this is giving you more or less a comparable perspective, and I can bring, well, probably if you want, I'll, I'll have a, I can show an extra adult there as well, so that if you want to have a better perspective. That's Mark's daughter, so meanwhile you can, you can take where You see, for instance, this is a 23-year-old individual, right? So you see, that looks more like your, your people, right? So you see, to kind of to get some more familiarity here. So this is obviously, this is the chip who been, you know, he had a car accident six years prior to that, right? And I guess that what you're seeing on the left here is a very typical appearance. So complete frozen collapse, but my line of reasoning is very simple. Again, look at him beyond the understanding of the pure spasticity. So, because we'll have a look at the pictures afterwards, and that we're going to see, but Straight away, over here, we can see a bunch of... What is that? You've got some fire drill? If it's anything, I'll come back. She doesn't come back. Okay. It's a very gentle alarm, I must say, right? any panic in the audience. Right? You know, just okay, so if we can try to keep some focus on this, I believe that the pictures, the picture on the left in particular, that's very familiar, right? And at the same time, I would like to bring your attention to two, to two elements there. Element number one. First of all, it's the sitting position, and well, like this is the same chip in the, so on the left and on the right, right? So, so this is the, it's like a year, or like 15 months in between. Obviously you can see that with the proper, with the thrifty rehabilitation addressing the development of the trunk, I believe it's quite obvious that the benefit for the seating improvements there is quite clear, right? But again, the key emphasis is very simple. This is the collapse of the upper body, right? This is the weakness of the supportive connective tissue. And due to the weakness of the supportive connective tissue, what happens? We actually experience this. He experiences all these troubles. All these troubles with getting himself properly seated. And classic concept would lead you towards thinking, well, let's evaluate the so-called postural muscles, right? Trying to uh, strengthen his back, trying to maybe even somehow strengthen the anterior abdominal ones, but the fact is that it's important to remember that they are attached 
right? All the muscles are attached to the underlying skeletal elements, right? And underlying skeletal elements, they sit over that supportive subvolume, which is dependent on the intra-abdominal pressure, dependent on the inter intra-thoracic pressure, dependent on their variations, and depending on those, like, nature's weight belt, as Mark just labeled it. So, and then, this is, this is the same chip two years later, right? And you can see that his stability in terms of the trunk positioning that continues to develop. And this is a big important line to show that the good thing about the connective tissue is that connective tissue, since it's so independent or requires so little to run from the perspective of the central control or from the perspective of the like, development and sustainability that even if we talk about the person who has completed the skeletal growth and formally speaking doesn't have much of the reserves for sort of structural in for structural transformation even for this type of person the focus on the connective tissue suddenly opens a lot of new avenues and this is the same chip just viewed from the front and again you can see that this is quite a considerable difference between. And what we are seeing is that obviously here, like on the left, he needed all sorts of supports and exhibited all the typical spastic postures, right? So this locked arms and then it was like classic case of the wooden, wooden body. And then you can see that a couple of years later, the significant strengthening of the upper body definitely translates into the obvious improvements in the quality of life of, of his own and particularly if you get to the next level of his care, right? So you see, like his mother is 50 something years old, right? And then when she has to transfer this chip from the bed and into the wheelchair and whatever, well obviously when he's rigid and stiff as a board and kind of tightens up towards any particular, any little move, well, it's not an easy life, right? So, because previously, typically, he required like two, if not three, handlers to get him properly placed, because he was so stiff. And then, well, the transition from three handlers to one person, well, in terms of quality or quality of life, had a significant transition. Plus, it's easier to transfer him in the chair, out of chair, and Generally, also the fact that he's became a lot more relaxed and kind of doesn't have this underground drain from the spastic and from this constant muscular tension, well, in general he became a lot happier altogether. Because obviously this is exhausting activity, right? And I guess you met this very often that, well, the mood of the individuals when this stiff wooden board condition is often not the best. I mean, which you can't blame them for that, right? But the question is how you can improve the situation, right? And this is exactly the line. This is one of the lines that's showing that, well, once we do this, once we improve the stability and the support from the cheapest levels, well, then the engagement of the muscles goes down and then basically, well, you observe all these sorts of benefits. And that's just, well, I mean, that those were different perspectives, diff different looks at this particular chip. So, this is just to illustrate that, well, I'm doing this to help you with the, to put it in some tangible perspective, because this is, well, I guess you can easily refer to this type of patient, right? Among the ones that you meet here, if that's the we talk about the young adults with the severe quadriplegic conditions. Well, this, well, she's like 15 years old, which is also not that far away, right? So again, familiar picture, and again, you would see the same story. What has been demonstrated before, what, what we were showing on the other picture, like we're trying to bring your attention to this same focus. Well, space between the abdomen and the ribcage, right? Oh, sorry, space between the ribcage and the pelvis, the abdominal support. Well, you look on this picture on the left, obviously there is not much there. There is a direct conflict between the lower ribs 
and the iliac bone and obviously besides of getting the profound discomfort in sitting position clearly that this type of the rib cage is not well this type of the trunk is not going to have much of the support right and then you look at her further on so this is well that was like again the 15 months in between because they're from the same country so this same dates there so this one another year later so what you can see that targeting the trunk brings the further stability factors she has changed overall posturally and again what does it translate into it translates into much improved quality of the sitting position you see like in the first ones i need to get all around her because she's sliding and not holding this position at all right and then the one couple of years later i'm managing her very easily with a single arm support and this is the situation when this brings a different perspective because this way what you're looking at this is the other side of the equation because when you looked at the support the mouse would it work now yeah. i mean so just, oh, I'm trying to get up. Oh, yeah, that's it. It was just hidden. Okay. So what I'm saying here right, is the in, another important perspective. When you look at the sitting position and look at it from that level of support, so you have to understand two things. One is that the pressure from the top that goes downwards, right? So you basically, if I go to use this, right? You see, if that was the pelvis and that was the, the abdominal space, right? So one thing is what happens, the weight of the body that comes from the top, right? That's one compression, level of compression of forces which is, which is being exhibited. But then the other thing is how it works from the bottom. Now we place her seating and now imagine that instead of this like construction of four strong glasses, right? I'm only going to have one. Now if I have one and I transfer the weight on it, what happens? It sinks in. So now we also have to evaluate it from the other end. Like how, what happens when the pelvis gets in contact with the ground? How does it tilt? How does it go against the abdominal space? So this is what you can see on this picture on the left. Basically, once you place her in sitting position and remove supports, like by the neck before that I had, for instance, in the in the previous one, right? What happens? She can't sustain this position at all because the, once the pelvis comes into contact with the ground, it tilts against the weak abdominal space. So basically, it's the same as trying to sit on this particular broken plastic thing. And the transition in sitting, like you see, for instance, this couple of years later, well, where does it come from? It comes from these two factors. One is the greater stability from the top, so it's the weight of the body against the abdomen doesn't compress it downwards but at the same time is the improved ability to withstand the reaction force that comes from the bottom at the same time as you do this well as the abdominal space improves well that facilitates certain structural transformations of the pelvis as well so basically the sitting platform improves as well because you see this is a classic picture you're trying to put a child or like a young adult into a sitting position he goes like this right if you think about it when you try to place them what happens they don't have much of a sitting platform they would sit on the back of their legs right but if a person sits on the back of his legs then the moment he gets any muscular activity what happens the muscles like the hamstrings they become like a hydraulic jet that lifts the car so then the person instantly slides so therefore the presence of any decent sitting platform is essential, right? But again, where could you get it from? Only by the development of the trunk. You can't get this via the like, attempts to fiddle with the muscles as such. So that's just a few lines to visualize these developments for you. And I mean, again, this is the person who by any like standard research science or whatever she by 15 years of age she has completed her skeletal growth like two years before that things were and you know that in the cp children especially like severe quadriplegic ones 
typically the skeletal maturity is reached earlier than in the healthy one. So it's like at least two, three years earlier than a regular story. So, but again, what we're observing, that even when the skeletal maturity has been reached, a appeal to the thrifty avenues, right, and the direct appeal to the connective tissue framework, well, shows a lot of potential in terms of improving the overall, like, quality of life, sitting, positioning, and so on. So this is just, well, one of these key lines here is to engage you into this reasoning that the discoveries that have been recently made in the field of the connective tissue research, they bring the interesting perspectives towards the field which has been always dominated by the ideas of signals coming from the brain and muscles being as the leading subject of any sorts of well, rehabilitation efforts. But again, when it comes to the severe individual in particular, when we get to draw this cut of line with the quadriplegic person, well, it's important to understand that, well, when you think about the lavish versus thrifty, often enough, or most of the time, a quadriplegic person, well, putting it simply, cannot afford much of the lavish things. And on opposite, once you go thrifty and once you go towards the base, once you go towards the direct strengthening of connective tissue elements, well, suddenly you open up a total new, like, treasure chest of potential improvement. Now, yes. From a therapy perspective, how do you identify the targeting of that? Ah, uh -huh, you targeting. see, uh, that's, this is a therapist, right? This, this is a <laughs> well, therapist. I, I, see, no, no, see, no, I understand the research, but now for the therapist, you see, the therapist, the therapist the, here they are, right? You see, we talked about, well, you know, guys, you know, let's say, let's leave it ourselves to the theoretical part, let's just build the umbrella and kind of show some indication, but, you know, once a therapist, always a therapist, right? It's like, you can't change this particular breed, right? Well, the thing is that in life, in real life, it looks, I'll need to bring you a little bit more over there. I'll still need to give you one more bridge, right? That, where is it? Well, by the way, that's the girl that was used in the example, right? So again, you can see that the same story. Once the trunk strength has improved, the quality of the performance improves significantly. So, here we're getting very quickly via this particular thing. So, deep fascial radial core, that 70, well, roughly what we say, 70% of the underlying body volume, whilst the musculoskeletal core will be, say, roughly the 30 of it. So, the key sample question is very straightforward. Well, if we want to improve the trunk support, we have to find a way to get at least some decent response from that underlying deep core, right? As opposed to, well, it's kind of quite, once you look at it from that perspective, it's quite logical that limiting your, your actions only to the musculoskeletal code alone, well, doesn't yield the full potential of the like improvement that a person might have. So, this is the idea that goes further, that our trucks are organized according to the radial symmetry, as opposed to longitudinal thing, right? Radial symmetry is quite clear, right? So you see, this is structure with the radial symmetry. So primary responses, there will be the ones which converge towards the center or diverge towards the periphery, right? And then we get to this fundamental thing, which, I mean, this is, for me, like one of the most influential pictures of all time. And this is extracted from the excellent courses on the anatomy dissections made by a gentleman called Jill Hadley. He has like four DVDs. He's an anatomist from Florida and he runs courses and so on. But this he has four DVD series. Basically his claim and his main feature is that he does the dissections in a layered perspective, right? Not the standard dissections that you learned when you were in school, but he does the layered perspective trying to follow the connective tissue divisions rather than 
following the sort of age-old classics of identifying or trying to like chop those pieces which well trying to match the cadaver with anatomy text. So and this really like goes in a way in a lot I think that it carries a lot of weight because when you realize that in classic interpretation you would always think well the rib cage and I mean like skeleton this is strong this is big this is solid and then everything like all this internal organs and all this stuff it's kind of just being attached to it hangs on by a thread like you know like the decorations of the Christmas tree when you look at it from that perspective you say wow this is a what is a rib cage rib cage is just a layer which as opposed to the uninterrupted integrity of this connective tissue drug. And again, don't think in terms of, like, the main invitation here is to stop thinking in terms of the internal organs, right? Internal organs are there, of course, but this is the purely metabolic perspective. It's like, think of this as this continuous, strong honeycomb of the connective tissue. And it's like a honeycomb, some, you know, like imagine that you, in that honeycomb, you different, have different compartments which have happened to have different contents. Some of them have, well, like these contents, metabolic contents are just like lungs, this is the breathing aspect, this is the liver, this is the spleen. That doesn't really matter, that's not the subject that interests us. This is the metabolic perspective. But from the mechanical perspective of the support, this is just a continuous framework, continuous honeycomb of the connective tissue. And then the other day we were talking about this thing, like, for instance, when you experience kids, well, like kids, adults with the baclofen pump, right? You met the ones? So what happens if the baclofen pump, which is being inserted into the abdominal space, what happens to it after a couple of years? It gets encapsulated, all surrounded, right? And what kind of tissue is being formed around it? Strong, powerful connective tissue, right? It's a compartment. And the fact that it's inside the abdomen doesn't mean that it, everything there has to be squishy, washy, you know, let's say, and very weak. So this is a very important message here. So therefore, what we, we end up with? Well, that's this simple message, right? Solid, incompressible, hydraulic core. And that brings us to this biggest question, which we were trying to target and trying to explain, that basically the idea of the stress shielding. The key trouble of addressing the internal layers is getting how do we bypass the external resistance. How do we get this in such a way that instead of being bounced back from the strong shell, because the first instinctive reaction that you would have, if you want to go deep, you would say, aha, we'll have to come up here, press harder. If we press harder, we're going to get deeper. That's the first intuitive reaction. The paradox is exactly the opposite. This is our very important, well, like this is, this is the model which is very counterintuitive. That's been made after extensive calculations by Mark. So that's his specialty, right? Engineering and the calculation of the complex models. And that's what part of what he was talking about. That in the beginning that calculating things in a straightforward way just with muscles and bones didn't make much sense. But this picture is a very essential. What we have, we have four elements here. Force inputs, suppose that was your hand, right? Now, force transfer media. Lately discovered some of the wonderful materials produced by the chemical industry. This is the super soft type of bolts which are used for the Pilates. And actually, well, I must say that the usage of the super soft balls made for the Pilates has been a major breakthrough in this user friendliness of the entire technique. So I'm going to show you a very simple sample. If that stability disc was kind of example of the target that we want to get, right? So you see, what we want to get, we want to find the balance where our load transfer, instead of doing this kind of popping action and getting just this 
type of the deformity of the outer shell, we have to find, you know, we have to divide it in several stages. Stage one, where we have to match the densities in such a way that there would be no deformity as such. You see, if I do it gradually, I don't have any of the popping effects. Stage two, I have to level it up. Come over here, just put the hand. Come. You are not going to land. You know? <laughs> don't have this telescopic hand, right? So you see, get the grip like this, so you see you want to feel the properties of tension. You see, that will be just the pop, right? And now, if you look at it, you would feel that the membrane itself is relaxed, right? So it's relaxed, there is no tension. If I do something like this, so you see that's just popping action, it doesn't change anything. So what am I going to do? Oops. I'm going to do this. If I do the first gradual loading of this thing, what happens? You feel the increase of the tension, right? So you see that's a relaxed state, this is the increased state of tension. And if I do this micro movement here, you're going to see that this state of tension increases, right? If I pop it off, it's going to disappear. You see, that's a simple idea, a simple principle in action. And if I overshoot it, it disappears again. So basically, what happens, and that's what we didn't show on the picture, but that was the most essential part there, that what the research about the connective tissue shows is that if you have a relaxed state like zero deformation, nothing happens to it. If you have the stretch which exceeds 3% of the length, like 3 to 8% of that range, that's the reparation that, ho that takes place via the micro theory. That's, this, that's what, for instance, myofascial release or any stretching things, that's what you're trying to imply. But then there is, well, above 8%, that's already going to be damaged, right? So, but then between 0% of the extension and 3%, you've got this range of 1% to 2% of the deformation, like mini stretch of this tension type that I've just shown here, that actually goes through the window of opportunity, which produces that remodeling of the connective tissue. So that window is narrow. The tools are kind of funny, right? Because, well, if you ask the question, how do we achieve these results with a ping ball? Okay, Leonid. <laughs> I have a hunch you can go on for another three hours. <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay, but I hope at least I've kind okay. of managed yeah. to cover and spark some interest, right? He's and then. Yeah, he's got a lot of scientific papers that I, I'll, I've got copies of them from um, Tiffany. I'll share them with you. And Tiffany is our contact over here, so it seems that we are starting some project with the CP kids, and therefore, if you will be interested, so therefore, obviously, there will be, you know, this is not a closure, this is just an opening, and I hope that has been interesting enough, right? Okay, thank you very much. And I hope that I didn't cause you any indigestion, right? <laughs>